So Shining Force Final Conflict, also known as Shining Force Gaiden 3 Final Conflict, also known as the real Shining Force 2, also known as Shining Force 1.5, is a Game Gear SRPG that is just incredible. It's hot sauce and a super soaker fun. It's the final game in our Shining Force CD slash Gaiden retrospective, and I am stoked to talk about it. Released almost a full year after Shining Force CD, Final Conflict is the final Game Gear title in the Shining series. The game, however, remained in Japan as support for the Game Gear in English territories was practically non-existent by 1995. Hell, support for the Game Gear worldwide was practically non-existent at this stage. As you can imagine, not porting Final Conflict to English-speaking territories was blasphemous. This heretical action lasted until 2006 when the good folks at Shining Force Central released their English language patch, and the people rejoiced. All 27 of us Shining Force fans rejoiced. We could finally play this incredible slice of Shining content. So let's get right into it. This is RPG Fortress's Mega Jumbo Super Large 4-part Shining Force CD slash Guide and Retrospective Part 4. Hope you brought someone who can cast or a four, things are gonna get messy. It's June 1995, and you are Sonic Co. Limited, and you are about to release your seventh Shining Force title in four years. You're super tired, and you need some vacation, because that's an obscene amount of content for such a small team. But don't get too cozy, you're about to release Shining Wisdom on the brand new Sega Saturn in about six weeks' time. Many staff members from the previous two Gaiden games return, including, of course, the Takahashi brothers Hiroyuki and Shugo, composer Motoaki Takanochi, and artist Hiroshi Takahashi. Having recurring members on all three of these game titles does a really good job of tying them together into their own little universe, although they are very much in the main Shining canon. While the Gaiden titles all fit together like glue, you will find that Final Conflict really glues these games together with the original Shiny Force and Shiny Force 2. You will find characters, themes, locales, music, and gameplay decisions that all tie these games together. More of that glue that I love. Game glue. Game glue all over the place. The story of Final Conflict begins a short time after the original Shiny Force in the lands of Shiny Force 2. We begin right in the thick of it with original Shiny Force hero Max chasing after circus marionette loving witch Michela. Michela's on a quest to revive Dark Soul because it's Shiny Force. The villains always want to resurrect someone. The intro video shows Max and his crew in an old temple chasing Michela. That old temple is the temple from Shining Force 2 where you fight the Taros and retrieve the caravan. We're 12 seconds into the game and nostalgia levels are already through the roof. Get ready to be constantly buried in nostalgia because this game has it in spades. And for the most part, it's mostly done in a good way. The shoutouts and callbacks all make sense. Max's crew, including fan favorite Adam, Stay behind in the temple to fight the horde of monsters while Max and dwarven warrior Rideon chase after the Dark Elf herself. And this is the main pull of the story. You're chasing Max, who's chasing Michela, who is on a quest to resurrect her lover Darksaul. After the battle, you citizens arrest a thief named Ruberan who is here to steal an ancient relic for Michela. Turns out Michela abducted his gang and is forcing him to retrieve this relic for her own use. While he doesn't join your force just yet, you do drag him along with you. You then head to the town of Hassan for info on what to do next. Turns out Hassan is right in the middle of Michela and her subordinate Lynx trying to kidnap the town's mayor. So you all engage in a big punch up and Ian joins as your leader. Yes, you don't meet and recruit your leader until battle two. Weird choice, but Shining Force can be pretty weird sometimes. After dunking on goblins for 20 minutes, you confront Michela and Lynx. Before they escape with the mayor, he pleads to Ian and his crew to track down Max and defeat Michela. Here's a good chance to introduce your starting crew. Ian is your leader and a young swordsman who surely has some sort of mysterious past because Shining Force tropes. Mead is your generic centaur knight, but he's also a high-powered tank who you'll probably use the whole game. Page is a solid dwarven warrior, but this game has a lot of terrain effects and his five movement really makes him a hindrance. 
Eagle-eyed Shiny Force 2 fans will recognize Howell's name, but not his portrait. Howell is Kazen's elderly teacher from Shining Force 2 who dies right when you meet him. He didn't even get a portrait, but in Final Conflict, you find out in his youth he is a Harry Potter cosplayer. He's also a Blaze user, so he was in my team the whole game. Sonic the Hedgehog fans will be quick to realize that Knuckles is not the same Knuckles from the Sonic the hedgehog averse. Knuckles in SF Gaiden 3 is an okay monk. Lastly, your starting archer, and the only archer you get due to the game's reduced roster, is Sonette. And you will use her the whole game because she is a damage-dealing queen. Also of note is that Adam tags along as well, but don't worry, this time around he is your advisor and doesn't join the battle team. You can visit him at headquarters to request healing, resurrection, item swapping, promotions, etc. The Force heads north of Hassan and fights some more idiots in the woods. This is where I will note one of my least favorite parts about Final Conflict. There are a lot of battles outside in the woods with really bad land effect. Land effect and bottlenecking just... Oof. Some of the worst battles in any Shining Force game are these types of battles, and... Final Conflict has a lot of them. After you finish off the goblins and orcs and whatever, the mayor's granddaughter Cynthia shows up begging to join the team. Cynthia is your healer, and she is really bad. Her spells and stats and all that are fine, save for her having barely any MP. And this is a game-long problem. Even being promoted and being a high level, she still has barely any MP. And a healer without MP is truly useless. It's a truly bizarre occurrence. Next up is an incredible battle and one of immense nostalgia. The Force needs to cross a bridge to make it further north when not just a Kraken, but the Kraken attacks. That's right, the whole Kraken from Shining Force 2 is here to make traversal dangerous. He busts up through the bridge creating several choke points where he will trap you and batter you. Eventually, Ruberon's minion Nashu shows up and uses some sort of foul smelling something or other to chase off the Kraken. Is sea life weak against smells? Oh well, it's a giant Kraken fighting elves and dwarves and centaurs, so let's suspend our misbelief and move on. Also, this is the only cameo from Joker the Yogurt I could find. After punching sea life for a little while, you make it to Ruberon's thief headquarters for thieves. Ruberon is absolutely shocked to find out that Michelle and her crew are devils. Michelle then murders a bunch of Ruberon's crew and fucks off because they wouldn't agree to fight the god Volcanon with her. It's now time to fight in a cave. Lots of enemies in this battle, and other than a few bottlenecks, traversal isn't too bad. After this battle, Ruberon agrees to join your force, and that's a great thing because he's a hell of a unit. His class is Thief, and he's basically a speedy damage dealer. Unlike Slade the Thief from Shining Force 2, Ruberon can throw knives from a space away, giving a bit more utility. Our next battle, and the end of Chapter 1, sees us revisit another Shining Force 2 map, the mountainside climb to the Birdman Town Badeau slash Volcanon's Lair. There's lots of monsters that will use the terrain to their advantage in this fight. Lots of archers, flyers, and spellcasters can choke you out on the choke points, so you might want to level up a little bit here. After the battle, Volcanon, who now has a portrait, hell yeah, thanks you for clearing out the devils. He confirms that Michelle and crew have a nefarious plot that involves doing something on Grand's Island. You vow to head across the ocean and deal with her. This is where a young Birdman fighter named Kiddo joins the force. Kiddo is basically the culmination of all the Birdmen from previous games in that he is a powerhouse. Another unit that I used the whole damn game. Chapter 2 begins with Michelle and her devil subordinates, Lynx, Aku, and Magus, all planning to do more spooky and nefarious things like capture Max and kill Ian. Meanwhile, the Force enters the cave system at Badeau to continue chasing Michelle. There's some dialogue here between your party members, which is nice to see because the early Shining Force games didn't get a lot of discussion from your party members save two or three important characters. After exiting the cave, you'll see the diabolical Magus 
Magus and his devil soldiers fighting the Centaur Knights of Pakalon. Another callback to Shining Force 2. The battle is yet another giant outside map with lots of terrain to cover. There's not any sort of woodland or mountain terrain slowing you down, but I gotta say I'm already bored of these big outside battles. It's a Shining Force trope though, we're gonna see lots more of this, oh well. After the battle completes, Magus is pretty upset that all of his soldiers are dead. Lynx makes fun of him for failing and the two retreat. You then get two brand new soldiers, hell yeah. You get the Centaur Knight Sylvia, who is a decent unit, but not as decent as Mead. You also recruit Julia, the Bird Woman, who is also a decent unit, but not as decent as Kiddo. Oh well, more units is more units. Following a brief respite in Pakalon, the Force bumps into Magus, threatening someone named Eric. Count how many Erics there have been in Shining Force and put your answer in the comments. Eric wants to meet Michaela, Magus wants to kill Eric, Lynx wants to fight Eric, so they have a big punch up. While waiting around and chit chatting, a load of baddies show up and start yet another bog standard world map battle with way too much space between the party and enemies, too many trees and not much more to talk about. Once you have finished trouncing orcs and archers, Magus has another meltdown. He blames you for his inability to capture Eric. He then, once again, flees. After a brief stop at a local town, we cut to Lynx telling off Magus for being shit. Just then, the Shining Force arrives. Turns out we are in Mound, a late game town in Shining Force 2. Some townsfolk greet you and welcome you to the town, to which Eric alerts you that you are now in an ambush. Oopsie doodle. Magus summons a load of jackass units for you to fight, and I love this battle. It doesn't do much to make it special, but it is just a nice looking map. Lots of trees and flower beds, a couple of wells you can search for items. Like I said, it's nothing special, but it's still a fun little battle. When you beat Magus' troops for the third time, he throws a fit and runs away yet again. You then get to speak to Eric directly. Turns out he joined the Devil Army to speak to Michaela, who he blames for the death of his father, the fan-favorite original Shiny Force villain, General Elliot. Eric then joins you, and he's a pretty decent soldier. He's a Dragonute warrior, which is a hell of a lot like a bird warrior. He flies, he uses a sword, his defense isn't great, and he has okay attack power. While not a super powerful unit, he's a cool dragon man, which makes him a party member for the rest of the game. Cut to Michelle chewing out Magus for being useless, as now he's lost, what, three times, four times? She gives him one last chance, and Lynx offers him his soldiers, but Magus turns him down, stating that he can do it himself. Yeah, right, fourth time's a charm, fifth time's a charm. You then engage Magus for the last time on top of the Nazca Lines, a giant dirt-covered bird, another callback to SF2 that fans will definitely recognize. The battle is long and arduous, with a lot of furniture on the terrain that is hard to get around, but with Kiddo, Julia, and Eric in your team, it could be a lot worse. Just keep in mind that the enemies in this battle hit pretty hard. After sending Magus back to hell, you are greeted by Goddess Metula. She's the goddess of love and goodness and all of that, but she's basically just here to pass on a message from Volcanon. She tells Ian that he has to stop the resurrection of Dark Saul. She tells you that Max was defeated on Grand's Island and has now been captured by Michaela. She officially dubs you the Shining Force and gives you the Necklace of Light. Unsure of how to make it to Grand's Island, you then meet Minto, a traveling magician who tells you that the Nazca Lines are actually a giant ancient flying machine. She tells you that she's going to help you figure out how to fly the thing and promptly joins your party. You all climb aboard the flying machine and cross the ocean to Grands, thusly bringing Chapter 2 to an end. Chapter 3 begins with Minto, Best Wizard. Minto is your bolt wizard, so you know you have to use her. Yes, she's a late game mage, so she needs a bit of babysitting, but it's well worth it. She has great spells and a load of MP to play with. After doing another big outside battle with Crummy Terrain, the Monk Morton joins you, and I have never used him a single time. I literally can't tell you a thing about him. I already have a monk I don't use, so why do I need another? Get out of here. 
You continue onward on your search for Max with some direction from Morton. Apparently, the Fortress of Gallum, hello Shining Force 2, is the current base for Aku. With this info gained, the Force heads to Roft, but fights some more devils in yet another slow, slow map. This map has a fun part towards the end, though, when you approach the last couple of devils, the beach floods, and you have to deal with some aggressive tentacles. It's not the Kraken, though, it's different colored tentacles plus the Kraken's back in Parmesia. The party stops at Roth for healing and weapon upgrades before heading to Gallum's Fortress. Here we see Aku postulating over the strength of the Shining Force. Lynx checks in on him to see if he's ready to fight the Force, but Aku only has agitation for him. Aku blames Lynx over Magus' death, even though Magus didn't want any help. Devil's gonna devil. This is a pretty good battle. There's a lot of terrain to cover, but it's all flat so your movement isn't hindered. There's some chests to find, some bottlenecks to work through, and lots of archers and mages to fight. Next up is a fight inside the fortress against Aku himself. This is another really fun battle. Once again, you have lots of archers and mages to fight, but you also have a lot of flying enemies as well. Halfway through the battle, the statues start to crack and reveal loads of angry gargoyles. Oopsie doodle. If you manage to make it all the way past these terrors, you still have to deal with Aku, who boasts 80 HP and has access to Freeze 3. Damn, what a fight. After defeating Aku, he laments being a punk-ass bitch and dies. You rescue the mayor of Hassan and continue onward to find Max. Shortly after leaving Gallum Fort, you encounter Mishela, her goons, and a host of dwarven slaves. You immediately start to traverse over the arid plain to engage with the witch directly. The force is besieged not just by devils during the fight, but also by giant and hungry antlions that burrow up from under the sand. It's not all dregs though, near the beginning of the battle you can recruit the ninja Sasuke, who is hiding in a cactus. He's a pretty decent unit. Also, he's pretty similar to Ruberan. After engaging and defeating Michela, you find out that it wasn't actually Michela. It's just another one of her illusions. She then kills the elder of Hassan with a lightning bolt because she's queen of the weasels. Seriously, that was uncalled for. You gather your force and head towards chapter four with a renewed strength. And the dwarves go back to dwarf town, I guess. Our fourth and final chapter begins with beating the crap out of Lynx. Hooray. This is the penultimate outside battle, and it's a doozy. Lynx and his cohort aren't too far away, but there is practically nothing but forest and mountain tiles in the way, so things are going to get very, very slow. A lot of the units are either ranged or flying, so he's not going to be nearly as kneecapped as you. Thankfully, Lynx himself isn't too bad. He's got a load of hit points, and his sword can hit for decent damage, but he doesn't have any spells, so you can swarm him easily once your units can reach him. Once the Devil Swordsman has been defeated, he does the noble villain routine by praising your strength and saying you might actually be the ones to win. In his dying breath, Ridion makes an appearance and confirms that Max is very close. Lynx wishes the Force luck and then dies. Oops, Ridion joins the team, but I've never used him, so who knows if he's any good. He's probably fine. The team then arrives at Gallum Castle and chats with King Gallum. I think that this is the same Gallum that's in Shining Force 2. He doesn't have a portrait, but Gallum in SF2 is really old, so I think the timelines do kind of mesh up there. Anyway, some devils show up and set the courtroom on fire, so get ready for that. The fire doesn't do any damage or anything, but it will seriously bottleneck your dudes. It'll even slow up the flyers as they can't fly over it. After a fierce and wild battle that's really good for leveling up, King Gallum praises you and your abilities and hands over a powerful sword that longtime fans will recognize, the Chaos Breaker. Hell yeah. You then spend a bit of time shopping in town. This is the last town before the end of the game, so it's time to get everything that you need. If you have the cash, grab as many healing reins as you can, especially since Cynthia won't have many casts of Aura 4 with her minimal MP pool. Next up, you are finally here. The absolute last outside fight. After this battle, no more trees, no more mountains, no more shattered movement. Yes. This is a wild battle. Across the map are floating blue orbs. These orbs will slowly and silently heal any unit's MP as you walk near to them. There are loads of magic using enemies on this map, so they will constantly be shooting out magic spells. But this affects you as well, so 
Let those spells fly. Fun note, this battleground is used twice in Shining Force 2. The first battle is meh, but the second battle is against the greater devil Gesp and his burst rocks. What a battle that was. Once you have finished fighting infinite MP enemies, it's time to approach Grand's Tower. This is where Zeon's sealed, but that's a different game. You'll fight against a host of powerful demons outside of the tower, but before the fight, Mashela mocks you and reveals that the boss of this battle is none other than Max himself. He enters the battle with a mask not unlike the one his brother Kane wore in the first game. What a callback. I love this game so much. So, it's a pretty tough battle. The enemies from here on out are totally unhinged, but worry not, you can find one of the best units hidden in this battle, Kojiro. This guy is a samurai, and just like Musashi before him, he hits very hard. Hard. He doesn't have any spells or anything, but his physical strikes are ridiculous. After using Max as a punching bag for a little while, Adam tries to remove the mask, keeping him enslaved to no avail. This is when a stranger appears and enters the scene. This man, with closed eyes, reveals he can remove the mask from Max as he is himself a greater devil. He introduces himself as Odd Eye. Odd Eye is an actual fan favorite character from Shining Force 2. He is introduced as an amnesiac young man who is blind. He eventually recovers his memories and realizes that he is one of the Devil King Zeon's generals. You fight him, and when you beat him, he laments that he couldn't be your friend. In a stroke of genius writing, Odd Eye joins you here in Final Conflict. We never got him to join in Shining Force 2, but he joins you here in Final Conflict. Thank you. This is awesome. Once the mask is pried from Max's face, it's time to fight Michela. And yes, this is the stage where Max joins your party. So we're going into the next battle with Max from Shining Force 1 and Odd Eye from Shining Force 2. Holy crap. Like every Shining Force game prior to this one, the final battle is two back-to-back -back fights with no chance to save or heal in between. You will be climbing up Grand's Tower to fight the Witch herself, and she also has plenty of powerful units to protect her. She's got Reapers, she's got Dark Generals, she's got Demons. Most frightening, though, is that she's also got five evil statues. Now, the evil statues are basically mini laser eyes. Once every couple of rounds, they will unleash a powerful laser attack that hits everything in their way. There are some nooks and crannies that you can hide in, but with how tall the tower is and how often they get turns, you are going to get blasted. I used all of my remaining cash to buy healing reins before this battle. Then, when you finally get to Michela, she has well over 100 hit points, seemingly endless MP, and bolt 3, so expect to take loads of damage. Now that being said, you have an ace up your sleeve for this fight. You have 13 party members. That's right, for this battle you are allowed to take 13 party members as opposed to 12. Odd Eye doesn't count as a proper party member, he's gonna join the fight regardless of who else you take. And he's a great unit. He's got great HP, defense, attack, plus he will occasionally use an eye laser attack that does ridiculous damage. Once you are finally able to defeat Michela, she uses the last of her strength to summon Dark Saul. After some brief dialogue, he transforms into a giant demonic manifestation and the final battle finally begins. This fight is a lot like the Dark Dragon fight in Shining Force 1, but instead of fighting three heads, you fight his head, left arm, and right arm. All three targets use incredibly powerful spells, so don't even think about rushing in and clumping your characters together. This guy will end you super fast. Your best chance at winning is taking as many long-range and flying characters as you can and try to pick off his targets one by one. Getting Bolt 3, Freeze 3, and Demon Breath all in one turn will flatline multiple of your units all at once. This is one of my favorite Shining Force final fights. Regardless of how powerful your units are, there is still a good challenge. There is a level of methodology that you will need to engage in this battle. It's a pretty good showcase for late game play as well as you will need some high level units to really get past him. Magnificent, just awesome. After striking down Dark Saul, Goddess Matula arrives on the scene and implores Ian to throw the Necklace of Light at Dark Saul. Ian hurls the necklace, it connects with the devil, and 
sends him spiraling into the pit below. Michela's plan to resurrect the devil is foiled. Her wicked love has been recondemned to the fires below, and the Shining Force is victorious. The party returns to Gallum Castle and reports into King Gallum. He is glad to hear that Darksaul is vanquished and suggests enshrining the Chaos Breaker near the tower as Zeon, the King of the Devils, is also buried there. He suggests the sword be renamed as the Force Sword, a plot beat that proves that the Chaos Breaker from Shining Force 1 and the Force Sword from Shining Force 2 are the same weapon. After some dialogue, Ruberan suggests that his pirate buddy Noshu become the King of Grands. I've been pretty on board for just about all of the nostalgia bait in this game, but generic NPC becomes Shining Force 2 King might be a bit much. During the discussion, Max, Adam, and Ian disappear. The Force chit-chat about this and are positive that they're off on another grand adventure. Fans have been speculating for years that Ian is Bowie's father, Bowie being the main hero from Shining Force 2, but there's not really anything canon-wise to connect this other than potentially the timeline matches up with this. I don't know, but what I do know, and what I forgot to mention at, at some point during this game, uh, they confirm that Ian is Kane's son, Kane being Max's brother, so Ian is Max's nephew. There is just so much going on. It's like an onion within an onion within an onion. Onionception. The game finishes with Odd Eye being an adoptive dad. It turns out that Michela and Dark Soul conjugated their wicked relationship and spawned a terrible hell baby named Mephisto. This Mephisto would go on to be the main antagonist in Shining in the Darkness. Yes, the first game in the Shining series. This is Star Trek levels of convoluted, but I love it. Shining Force Final Conflict is a hell of a game. While it doesn't bring anything new gameplay-wise to the Shining series, what it does bring is loads and loads of story beats. This game is like an irreplaceable puzzle piece that you didn't even realize was that important. It's a linchpin outshined by its bigger and more well-known brothers. The gameplay is no different from the gameplay of any of the other Shining Force games. I think it's great, but I can appreciate that a lot of people by this stage wanted an update. Unfortunately, we wouldn't get this gameplay update until Shining Force 3 on the ill-fated Sega Saturn. And as I've already talked about this, the version of Shining Force 3 that we got in the Western world was severely truncated. Shining Force Final Conflict has solid, if unremarkable, classic Shining Force gameplay. But the reason you play this game is for all of the story beats, connections, and nostalgia bombs linking all of the pre-SF3 games together. Final Conflict is a side story in name only. Final Conflict is the main story in practice. If you love these early Shining games, you owe it to yourself to play this game. Don't just take my word for it. The incredible fan translation from Shining Force Central should be indication enough for you. This translation was a labor of love, and it's one of the cleanest and sharpest fan translations I have ever seen. Shining Force and Shining Force 2, along with Shining Force Gaiden and Shining Force Gaiden 2, are all made so much better by the inclusion of Final Conflict. Don't sleep on this title any longer. Go and play it. Shining Force has been my favorite game series for a very long time. The colorful world, cartoonish characters, well-developed races, and incredibly well-realized history sit perfectly with the easy yet addictive gameplay. The series has so much jam-packed into it by such a small team. Sonic Co. Limited created so much incredibly impressive art within just a few years that you can't help but feel that these games should be locked in a time capsule somewhere, but they're right here to enjoy. These games are nowhere near as complex as Final Fantasy Tactics. They are not as difficult as Tactics Ogre. The characters are not as in-depth as Modern Fire Emblem. The story is not as well honed as Triangle Strategy, but that's why they are good. I love a nice, solid, complex, mind-breaking tactics game, but the SF games are just perfect for jumping right into. Shining Force CD, Gaiden, Sword of Heja, and Final Conflict are incredible additions to the Shining world. 
Yes, they are mostly truncated. Yes, they feel smaller than SF1 and 2, but they are just ensconced with that beauty that the mainline games shine with. Denying these titles is like denying Deep Space Nine. Yes, you can enjoy Star Trek without it, but why would you want to skip such enticing adventures that make the whole thing so much better? I really, really hope you enjoyed these reviews, and I really hope you try out these Forgotten Shining titles. For RPG Fortress, my name is Richard. Please like the video, and don't forget to hug a cat. Bye for now.